A lifetime of tasting letters has affected my visual palate in an undeniable way. I know letters like I know tomatoes. They nourish me physically, expressively, and aesthetically, and every time I make something out of them, I both join and intervene in the world's relationship with them. I come to this talk with 50 years of lettering and 40 years of cooking under my belt, and it wasn't all that long ago that I recognized that my work in both arenas was connected. I didn't create the elements, I didn't invent the techniques, but I have added to eat the history of each, each time I cook. No Portlandia references intended here, but I'm currently obsessed with this locally sourced font designed in Lancaster. Luxurious and high contrast. It has the same fascination for me as the elusive pawpaw that grows on the banks of the Susquehanna. It just feels good knowing I live so close to where tasty stuff grows. To assume things are better because they're handmade is poppycock. Can you imagine a triple creme Velveeta, a microbrewed yuhu, a DIY pop tart? Calligraphy wouldn't be appropriate for this wayfinding signage. Although I have had a couple of artisanal cheeses that got me where I wanted to go. Handcraft breeds imperfection. When it's rooted in sincerity, it's something that most people find very refreshing. There's variation in ingredients, tools, expertise, even barometric pressure. And I'm a firm believer that you can taste the love in a dish, just like you can feel the spirit in a great logo. When something is made by hand, the aura of the maker is in the thing. And the consumer will never know the particulars, but will sense them on an intuitive level, mentally and physically. The same exuberance and timelessness that can be sensed in a hand-painted sign is found in a dish of homemade cinnamon ice cream. There's a certain fairy dust that's attached to things that are made by hand. It's the maker's physicality and intention. And the familiarity born of the crafting of that thing again and again adds to the magic. I feel the same way when I'm chopping vegetables for a roux as I do when I'm drafting a slab serif with a ruling pen. And wallowing in process feels really good. The way tools feel and ingredients feel is intoxicating. And even when I'm really tired, I find as much comfort in the way that that final upward swashy stroke on the W feels as I do when I'm whisking chunks of cold butter into a beurre blanc. Both lettering and cooking are part artistic and part scientific and aren't as effective when they're not well done. One has to master the basics, practice, learn from failure, and savor success. And after a while, a funny thing happens for some people. they get the desire to go rogue. Neither lettering or cooking works for me when too prescribed, in my own work and in the work of others. If your cooking is too formulaic, I can taste it. If you selected a type of face for that book that you didn't feel, I can see it. You can't bullshit me. That said, a huge component in the quest for excitement in the studio and kitchen is limits. Having to make stuff fit certain parameters brings creative thinking and innovation to the fore. Constraints make it happen, so if few exist, I'll impose them on myself. I've been known to be a culinary MacGyver in a snowstorm, and I have some pretty strong chops when it comes to making black on white pop. This gal does not need foie gras or process color to have fun. There's something really wonderful about competing with yourself. At some point, I learned the value of empty busyness and came to appreciate the brain space that blooms while consumed with work. Where I once thought jessamine a canvas or mincing ingredients was a big bore, I now saw the value of tedium. And both my lettering and cooking have benefited from this more uh, mature relationship with my process. I make stuff so I can record events, share secrets, express honor, and tell stories. And everything carries a connotative load. Forms, flavors, patterns, and textures contain seasonal, historical, cultural, and societal messages, some blatant and some more subtle. For me, the biggest part of making is the allure, the allure of the narrative. There's personal stuff in the outcome, whether truth, fiction, or a mix. Each consumer brings his or her own experience to the table. I love it when someone asks me what a piece means and I get to reply, 
A shiny red paintbrush or a bright orange egg gift can send me in the direction of making something, whether a savory line of verse or a straightforward salad. It's the potential to be inspired by the sensual that is the impetus for my making. And the kitchen door swings both ways. The color of what I'm eat, eating often ends up in my artwork. When I'm finished with a piece of lettering, I often feel like Nigella Lawson, whose advice after completing the prep of a creamy, bacony pasta carbonara was to pile it onto a plate and carry it proudly aloft. The prospect of pleasing others is a pride point for me. That said, neither lettering or cooking means much without other people. Certainly I can read alone, I can eat alone, but I can't be fully engaged unless I see the twinkle in your eye when you smell my sourdough bowl, or hear you chuckle at an expletive I rendered in an ornate script. My typography and my food allow me to speak to you. My hope is that both will nourish you, because I wouldn't be doing either if it was not for you. Perhaps one day we should get together with our pens, knives, brushes, whisks, and make something delicious. What do you say? If you'd like to see more of my work, check it out at melrogers.com. Bon appetit, and thank you.